Hello friends. We will learn a few more things about groups today. Specifically, we will learn about three different concepts that is cohesiveness, conformity and obedience. But before we begin with that, there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind when we are talking about groups. One is group size. Groups could vary in their size anywhere from two people that is a dyad to a huge group something like 10,000 people sitting in a stadium at a particular point in time. So the size of group could vary a lot. But for a group to work towards a specific goal effectively, generally it has been found that somewhere around five to seven people constituting a single group could make an effective group. Similarly, there is one more fact about groups that you need to keep in mind and this is with respect to the composition of the group. A group could be very diverse, very varied in terms of age, race, ethnic background, the basic difference of men, women. So these are also factors which influence how people behave in groups. Keeping these in mind, we will look at what cohesiveness is in a group context. What is cohesion? Cohesion means coming together. Co cohesion means holding together. So cohesiveness in groups specifically refers to all those factors or all those features which holds together a particular group of people. It is the degree to which group members are attracted to each other and are motivated to stay within the group. Why are we so interested in understanding cohesiveness in the context of groups? This is because how a group functions depends to a large extent on the degree of cohesiveness in a group. Highly cohesive groups have been found to express much greater solidarity. There is a greater sharing of resources, there is a greater support extended towards each other in cohesive groups. Cohesive groups are also homogeneous. What do we mean when we say cohesive groups are homogeneous? Cohesive groups influence the members to such an extent that to a certain point people think alike, do things alike and look at issues in a similar manner. So this ensures a homogeneity within the group. There is also a greater goal orientation and achievement orientation in highly cohesive groups. It's also found that highly cohesive groups demonstrate higher levels of morale compared to other groups. Let's take a group of friends, okay? Now, the teacher has suggested that some topics have to be discussed and prepared on a group basis and the students should come prepared to the class to discuss it and answer questions, say, couple of days down the line. Now, one group consists of three people who hang out together, who go out together, who probably live close by who go to college together, come back together and share a whole lot of things. The other group consists of three people who just have a hello hi kind of a relationship but who have been now brought together, put together to work on this specific assignment for the first time. Now what happens? The three people who have known each other for long have already reached a certain level of comfort. They have already, they know about each other, they know their personal likes and dislikes, they know their styles. So this is already a group which has been in existence and there is a greater degree of cohesion. So quickly there is an understanding reached between the group members as to how to go about it. How do we do things? And the task is completed much more effectively, much more quickly and probably in a more resourceful manner. 
Let us take the case of the second group. What happens? Initially, some time is spent on just trying to figure out who is going to do what, on trying to figure out how to distribute the work, how to go about it. And then some pleasantries are exchanged, mutual information is exchanged, all this takes time. So, this group, this cohesion is far lesser and all of them probably will are, are going to go back to their own group of friends once this assignment is completed. So, their interaction is also very, very formal and business like. Their interaction is restricted only to the assignment on hand. So, the output or the goal achievement in the case of the second group is going to be distinctly different from what the first group could achieve. So, highly cohesive groups are far more goal oriented and task oriented and they perform far better than non-cohesive groups. Another interesting thing that was found in the case of cohesive groups is when there is competition. Let us say there is another group which is also working on the same topic. Okay? In such cases what happens? A highly cohesive group demonstrates a sense of competitive spirit, a sense of competition and the cohesiveness within the group propels the group members to give their best, to do a little more than what they would probably do normally. And so, in the bargain, the presence of competition has actually increased the commitment of the group members. So, whenever there is some sort of competition or whenever there is the presence of an out group, as in let us say there is an entire class and the teacher identifies just three or four people to do a particular work. And then she says, this is a very important topic and I want you to read it up, be prepared, come and present it in the class. Now, in the entire class when the teacher has picked up just these three people who already happen to be friends, what is happening? This is a highly cohesive group and they see themselves as one unit distinct from the rest of the class. So, the in group consists of these three people and the rest of the class becomes the out group and in such a situation the three students would put in far more effort and work far more to do a very good job of presenting the topic to the class as compared to what probably each one would have done if the topic was randomly assigned to one of them along with some others. So, naturally as psychologists we would be interested in finding ways and means of making groups more cohesive and more effective. So, how do we go about this? How do we ensure that there is a higher degree of cohesiveness within groups? One way of doing this is to make smaller groups. Smaller groups develop a higher degree of cohesion far faster and this cohesiveness tends to be maintained far better when the group size is smaller. So, one way of increasing group cohesiveness is to make the group smaller. A second way of ensuring that there is greater group cohesiveness is agreement on group goals. If all the group members agree on what the group has to achieve, how to do it, what is the work that needs to be done, who does what, how much of involvement is required. Now, if there is agreement of all the group members on all these issues, there is a far higher degree of cohesiveness that can be achieved. The third way is simply get people to spend more time together. Typically, you find this in the work environment. People who have been with each other longer, when they are given a work to be done together, there is a greater degree of understanding, a greater degree of coordination, which is a manifestation of the cohesion within 
that group of individuals. So, whenever people spend more time with each other, the cohesiveness within the group increases. So, how can we encourage cohesiveness? By actually giving time to people to spend time together. Members of a group, if they spend more time with each other, it would automatically translate into greater cohesiveness for the group. So, spending more time is one more way of increasing group cohesiveness. There is another way in which group cohesiveness is encouraged. Heard of outbound programs? Outbound programs are programs where people are taken, boot camps, outbound programs. In such programs, what happens? These are typically practiced in the work environment, in the corporate sector today, where people, a group of people are taken together, taken to a remote place and spend some time together, one day, two days, three days, depending on the length of the program. And during this program, what happens? All these people are engaged in doing certain activities together. This these kind of programs are actually built on the principle of building cohesiveness in groups, building greater cohesiveness in a set of individuals. When people are removed, set apart, isolated and made to spend time with each other, in such cases, greater cohesiveness is encouraged between the members and thereby you have a highly cohesive group. So typically when people are expected to work on a project as a team, companies sponsor the team members to go for these kind of activities so that there is a greater degree of understanding, greater degree of coordination and a much higher cohesiveness within this particular group. And why would they be interested in a cohesiveness? Cohesiveness ensures better performance faster performance, more accurate performance and lesser degree of conflict within the group. One more way of encouraging cohesiveness is to stimulate competition between groups. When there are multiple groups, by stimulating competition, what happens? The group cohesiveness increases. A very, very simple example which all of us would know is when we are at a party or a function, people randomly divide themselves into two groups and start playing games, games like Antakshari or some such games. What happens? A few minutes into the game and you are passionately defending your group. So, whenever there is a sense of competition, the cohesiveness within the group increases. The other possible way of improving cohesiveness is to give rewards to groups and not to individuals because cohesiveness within the group is very important for maximizing performance of the group. We will now look at another topic which is a very, very important topic with respect to understanding how people behave in groups. This is what is called conformity. Conformity is a type of social influence to match with or to suit the group's behavior, group's expectations and group's norms. This is what conformity is all about. There were several psychologists who were interested in studying how conformity works. Ash was one such psychologist who came up with a series of experiments. He had two sets of cards. On one card, was a single straight line, a vertical line, say about 6 inches, 5 inches, somewhere around that length. On a second card, so this first card with a single line was what was called the reference card. On a second card, there were three lines, okay, three lines of varying lengths, three vertical lines, each named A, B or C of varying lengths. Suppose the first card has a length a line of length uh, 6 inches. The second card would have A of 6 inches, B of 8 inches and C 
probably of 5 inches or 4 inches. In this experiment, what Ash did was he got groups of 8 people together, 8 people sitting together around a table facing each other. What happens when people are sitting in a circular formation? Every person is visible to every other person. There is a face to face contact between all the members of the group. Now, the instructions were very simple. The subjects were told, please see the two cards and tell us which line on the second card matches with the reference card. So, in the example that I have taken, A. it would be A. Now, here was the twist in the experiment. What Ash did was, in reality, only one person was an innocent subject and all the rest were confederates. They were actors who were given a prior information as to how they should respond to each set of cards. And in each trial, they were told either to give a correct answer or to give a wrong answer. And 18 such trials were conducted with each group. So what happened? Initially, when the first time the cards were flashed, each of the members was asked which line A, B or C matches with the line on the reference card. Now in the first couple of rounds, the correct answers were given. The innocent subject was asked the seventh time, as in first six confederates were asked, then the innocent subject was asked and finally one more person was given a chance to give his response. So, the innocent subject was the seventh person to respond to the question. He gets to hear the answer of six people before him. So, what happened? The first couple of times the correct answer was being given. So, nothing much happened. It was what was expected. Then, as a group, all the six subjects started giving wrong answers. And uh, the cards which were shown had lines of varying lengths. And the same instruction every time, the subjects were asked to match the reference line to one of the lines A, B or C in the second card. What do you think the results were? The innocent subject would have under normal circumstances given what he thought is the right answer, right? That's what we would expect. But the results didn't show that. In fact, the results showed that even though the person knew that answer to be wrong, he or she went along with the answer given by the rest of the group. The group pressure was acting and making the person to confirm to whatever was the choice of the group. This study, that is batches of eight, was conducted with 60 different subjects, repeated several times with several variations, but the basic design of the study was the same. Now the results showed that one third of the responses were actually wrong responses. That is, the majority effect was coming into play. What is the majority effect? The majority effect in the study was measured as the percentage of wrong responses which confirmed to what the majority said. Okay? So, they are confirming to the majority and these are errors. These are not the right answers. Out of 18 trials, 12 trials were wrong responses, 6 were right responses. So, in these 12 trials, if the subject confirmed with the majority, it was an erroneous response which was being given because of group pressure. This was in turn contrasted compared with another group, the control group, where there were no instructions. And in the control group, there were almost no errors. It was the correct answer being given every time. So, what does this show? This shows that the individual was actually giving into the group pressure despite knowing that the answer was wrong.
Now, subsequently there was another variation that was done to this test. One confederate was told to give a different answer. Let us say the reference card has a line of 6 centimeters and the other card has three lines A, B, C. B is 6, A is 4, C is 8. Now, from the first subject to the sixth subject or from the first subject to the fifth subject, they say the matching line is A, which is 4 centimeters. The fifth subject, however, says no, it is C, the line measuring 8 centimeters. So, there is one person who is going against what the majority is saying. In such an instance, what they found was the innocent subject gave correct answer rather than giving into the group pressure. What did this demonstrate? Even when there was a slight, a single person which, who was going against the majority, in such cases also the degree of conformity drastically decreased, drastically went down. There was another variation that was done to the experiment where people were asked to write down their choices. They were not told to spell it out aloud. They were told to write down their choices. What happens when you write down your answer? The people around you would not know what you are writing. So, you do not know what the first person is writing, second person is writing or the eighth person is writing. You only give your answer based on your own judgment. In such cases also, there was no conformity displayed. When you watch all those TV shows where uh, whoever is sitting on the chair does not know the answer and the majority choice is taken. What happens there? Though I do not know the answer, the minute the majority says C is the answer, I will go ahead with that answer. Does that mean that I have suddenly realized that C is the correct answer? No, because the majority has said that the factors of group pressure are coming into play, conformity is coming into play and I would like to go along with the group, I would like to confirm with the group. Since all these people are interested in the same show, all these people are participating in the same show and all these people have voiced an opinion, it should be right. It is probably right. So, I will go along with it. The other uh, thing that was noted during these experiments was when there was a large variation in terms of the length of the line. Let us say one is 2 centimeters, the other is 3 centimeters and the third is 8 centimeters. The reference card contains 8 centimeters. So, if someone says A or B is the right answer, the deviation from truth is much, much larger. So, when this kind of a deviation was there, the degree of independence, the degree to which a, the innocent subject was emphasizing and demonstrating his answer which is away from the majority effect, that was far more. So, when there was a greater deviation from truth, conformity went down. But when the graying was greater, when the clarity was less, in such cases there was a far greater degree of conformity being demonstrated in the group context. It is not just the context or the stimulus itself which makes a difference. There are other factors also which come into play when you look at how much of conformity is exhibited by people in the context of groups. Some of these factors are individual factors and some of them are situational factors. One factor is the status of the person within the group. Within the group, if the person has a higher status, the degree to which he or she would conform is lesser than the other group members. So, being subject to group pressures is lesser when an individual 
assumes a higher status within the group. For example, when you look at a typical department, there is a supervisor and many subordinates. Let us say three or four subordinates are looking at a problem with two possible solutions. Now, all the three may not have made up their minds. Two people say that A is the right solution. What will generally happen? The third person will go along with it. What do you say? Yeah, even I think A is the right way of doing it. But if the same discussion is happening between two subordinates and a superior, there is every chance of the superior saying, no, 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 let us try out B. Why is this happening? The person has a higher status within the group and that gives the individual the power not to yield to group pressure. So, conformity goes down when the status differs within the group. Similarly, one more interesting finding that research has shown is that women in general tend to confirm more to whatever the group says compared to men. There is a gender difference that has been seen in terms of conformity in the group context. Women in general tend to confirm more, tend to fall in line more than men have demonstrated. Then there is something else called injunctive norms. Tell me, as a student, you study for the whole year, take an exam at the end of the year. During the exams, when you are expected to learn things, go and write your answers to a question paper, would you carry your books inside? Would you carry slips inside? Would it be tolerated if you do like that? No. So, this is how an injunctive norm works. An injunctive norm ensures conformity to the norm. There are also some other interesting norms called the situational norms. So, irrespective of all other factors, sometimes situational norms within a group also dictate conformity behavior. But then now, uh, why do we engage in conformity behavior? Why is it that people were giving the wrong answers though they knew that they were wrong? There are two reasons. One, we want to be right. If everybody is saying a particular answer, there must be some logic to that answer. This is informational social influence that is coming into play. The other reason is we want to be liked. We want to be liked by all the others who are part of the group. We want them to think that we are, I am also one of them, that we are part of the group. So, this desire is what is called the normative social influence. So, today we have understood two very interesting concepts that is conformity behavior in groups and cohesiveness in groups. 